Now you can play a part in the ultimate Pokemon battle. Trainer versus Trainer. <laughs> the Pokemon trading card game. All the creatures, all the battles. Grab your starter pack and start playing the Pokemon trading card game. Good clean fun. The first year of Pokemon was a resounding success. Cards were flying off the shelves and fans were flocking to local card stores and hobby shops to take part in some of the TCG's first competitive scenes. As exciting as these locals were, Wizards of the Coast, the company that printed and distributed the cards, had other plans. Following the release of the Team Rocket expansion, Wizards kicked off the first series of organized play that would culminate in the first Super Trainer showdown aboard the SS Anne. Uh, I mean the Queen Anne. You may not have needed a ticket from Bill to get in, but you still needed to qualify. Join us as we journey back to the TCG's earliest days, a time before you could Twitch stream high-level gameplay from the comfort of your own home, a time without the sound of Puka and Crims commentating filling your headphones, a time even before two prizers. We're going back to the dawn of the millennium and the beginnings of Pokemon organized play. April of 2000 saw the release of the fourth Pokemon TCG set, Team Rocket. Containing 66 unique cards with hollow and non-hollow variants of all rares, except Dark Raichu, this set focused on the villains of the franchise and the Pokemon they used to fulfill their nefarious goals. Boasting far more new cards than the previous two expansions, Team Rocket introduced the Dark Pokemon mechanic to the game. Essentially, these Pokémon were Stage 1s and 2s that, while functioning like any other evolved Pokémon, dealt more damage, but had less HP as a trade-off. That's pretty good game design, except when you consider that a lot of them, like Dark Flareon and Dark Jolteon, had the same HP as their lower stage Eevee. That's not exactly great when you have so many big HP basics running around. If you're going to the trouble of evolving your Pokémon, you'll want some sort of HP buff, and that was certainly lost here. Despite the overall lack of playability, there were some good Pokémon released, even if many were overlooked at the time. For the first time, Pokémon powers could inflict status conditions on active Pokémon, such as Dark Gloom confusing either player's active, or Drowsy putting them to sleep. The strong powers did not stop here. Rattata let you switch a card from the top of your deck with one of your face-down prize cards. Use it with Mankey from Jungle, and you have a pretty decent chance of stacking your prize cards in your favor. Best, or perhaps worst of all, was Dark Vileplume, which stopped both players from playing trainer cards. At the time of its release, players failed to appreciate just how oppressive this card was. Everything with that gray border and wood board heading was a trainer card. Supporters and stadiums were not their own distinct subtype of trainer yet. Though Dark Vileplume's hay fever affected both players equally, the players setting up Dark Vileplume could just blow through all their trainers and set up their hand and board for success before placing Dark Vileplume into play. Their opponent didn't have the same luxury. Get Dark Vileplume into play, and only Muck from Fossil could save your opponent's precious trainer cards. Where the Pokémon were lacking, the set made up for it in strong trainer and special energy cards. Here Comes Team Rocket was a unique card that flipped both players' prize cards face up. Comboing with the new Rattata, this could help players see both what they prized and what prizes their opponents were taking. The Boss's Way expanded on the ability of trainers to search the deck, allowing a player to search for a dark Pokémon without a cost. Challenge provided a way for Do the Wave players to easily fill their benches, and if their opponent declined the challenge, well, it was just another bill. Nightly Garbage Run finally provided a viable means of recovery for Pokémon cards, and a discard-free means to recover energy cards. As such, it replaced energy retrieval in most decks upon its release. 
This card would be playable in another, more power crept era of the game, in the form of Super Rod, so you know this three card recovery effect was good at the time. Team Rocket also provided Disruption Trainers, which were more powerful and one-sided than Lass. Goop Gas Attack functioned as a trainer version of Muck, shutting off all powers until the end of your opponent's next turn. Talk about leaving Rain Dance out in the cold. Interestingly enough, this card was mistranslated and thus misplayed. The original version of the card was intended to only shut off powers already in play. If you played down a new Pokémon with a power, it technically would work under Goop Gas Attack. But that's not how we play the card on TCG1, and it's certainly not how it was played at the time. Imposter Oak's Revenge was another strong trainer, requiring your opponent to shuffle their hand back into their deck and draw four new cards for the cost of discarding one of your own. This was essentially a stronger Imposter Professor Oak, a card that never saw much play upon release back in base set. To give you an idea of how strong Oak's Revenge was, the modern day version of the card, Red Card, is so good that it remains banned in the expanded format to this day. Oak's Revenge was especially potent when you considered its release alongside Rocket's Sneak Attack, one of the strongest trainers in the game up to this point. Sneak Attack allowed you to look at your opponent's hand and shuffle any trainer card you found there back into their deck. This card provided both game knowledge and disruption, and you could run four of them. The combination of Imposter Oak's Revenge and Rocket's Sneak Attack could leave your opponent with a dead hand on the first turn of the game. And this wasn't that difficult to pull off either, given all of the powerful draw trainers released in base set. Decks would soon begin dropping Lass entirely in favor of this one-sided disruption combo. Team Rocket also gave us three highly playable special energy cards. Full Heal Energy healed a special condition from the Pokémon it was attached to, and Potion Energy removed one damage counter, but these paled in comparison to Rainbow Energy. In exchange for taking 10 damage when attached, this card provided one energy of any type to the Pokémon it was attached to. Gone were the days of players scared to run decks with more than two types of energy. Multicolor Toolbox decks finally had the card they needed to become a force in the meta. With the release of Team Rocket came the start of an organized tournament circuit. Though Japan designed the cards, the US company Wizards of the Coast was tasked with printing, distribution, and organized play in the West. They devised the Super Trainer Showdown Tournament Series, with the first STS taking place in Long Beach, California in July aboard the Queen Mary, a boat party that would truly rival that of the SSN in Vermilion. In order to qualify, all players needed to do was win at least three games in a row at STS qualifier tournaments held across the country at different shopping malls. Unfortunately, almost all of the events took place in the western part of the country, which I guess makes sense given that this was for the West Coast STS, but it left players in the East without an easily accessible means to qualify. If you were lucky enough to make it to one of these qualifiers, you'd have to battle your way through one of six tournaments, or three a day. When you account for age divisions, that's a whopping nine tournaments being held daily. I can only think of the headache this is giving any of our tournament staff viewers. The uniqueness of the tournament setup doesn't stop there. Instead of Swiss rounds, each tournament was single elimination with a maximum limit of five rounds. This meant that attendance was capped for each event at 32, and four players from each tournament would go 3-0 and receive their golden invitation to Long Beach. Each round lasted 20 minutes, with a winner being declared based on who had taken more prize cards when time was called. At the end of a game, players were also scored on how many prizes they had allowed their opponents to take. A perfect sweep resulted in six points awarded. If your opponent took a prize, you only got five points, and so on. The top two players with the most points in their age division at the end of all the weekend's six tournaments received paid trips to the STS. So not only did you need to win games, but you had to win them convincingly if you wanted a shot at that travel award. Without any further ado, let's take a look at some of the lists that survived from players who qualified for Long Beach. William Hung took second at one of the tournaments in Torrance, California, piloting his old-fashioned Haymaker deck through the competition before losing to a Wigglytuff deck containing Mr. Mime as a tech to handle opposing Hitmonchan. Two noteworthy things about his deck were the lack of Rocket's sneak attacks and his observation that he kept whiffing energy cards. 
I note he played 20, but uh, we'll move on. The following weekend in San Jose, a few players got a bit more experimental. One took her Gengar Wigglytuff deck, narrowly missing qualifying for the STS during the first day of play. Finally, on the second day, she took down multiple Haymaker and Wigglytuff decks to secure her golden invitation. Arizona saw Chad Mills dominate his competitors with his take on Wigglytuff, recognizing the strength of hand disruption cards like Lass and Sneak Attack, as well as the power of the new Special Energy cards. Not only did he outperform the competition, but he managed to only give up two prize cards during five rounds of play across two tournaments, ending the day with a whopping 28 points and a free trip to Long Beach. Truly a respectable performance by Chad, with a pretty consistent build of Do The Wave. Wigglytuff was everywhere that weekend, not just in Chad's hands. Another player went 4-0 with a Hitmonchan variant of Wigglytuff, looking to add consistent draw by including the new Team Rocket card challenge over other hand disruption cards. While he didn't have as strong of a performance as Chad, this list speaks to the diversity within meta archetypes at the time. That same weekend, another creative player brought a deck filled with new Team Rocket cards, recognizing the strength of Dark Vileplume and the polarizing effect it could have on gameplay. Unfortunately, he never made it past the first round, which is too bad because I do respect his creativity. Rounding out the qualifiers we have information on, we head to Texas. First, in Dallas, a tricolor deck featuring Mewtwo, Electabuzz, Magmar, and for good measure, Haunter, earned an invite. The deck seemingly was focused on playing whatever Pokémon could hit the expected meta for their weakness. One player relied solely on the power of Mewtwo, with a supporting cast of characters including Tauros and Ditto, winning one of the day's tournaments. With so few Pokémon and energy cards, this player had room for tons of trainers to counter opposing barrages of sneak attacks. He even ran Goop Gas Attack to deal with opposing Mr. Mimes with ease. Lastly, we head to Houston, where we take a look at one of the most unique decks seen thus far, Wigglytuff and Friends, including Dark Dragonair to search for evolutions, and Dark Slowbro to recover Pokémon from the discard pile. Clearly, they were a bit ahead of their time in recognizing the power of Pokémon to support a deck's main attacker. Using this deck, the player took home two tournaments on the second day of play. Though perhaps not the most geographically diverse, these qualifier tournaments were a great first foray for Wizards into competitive Pokémon. Held free of charge with strong prize support including packs, caps, and t-shirts, the community was no doubt excited to have such strong support from the company. While that would quickly change, players now enjoyed the benefits of all the interests surrounding the game. Free side events included league play, battles against master trainers, and opportunities for young kids to learn more about the game. With the STS qualifiers concluding in early July, all eyes turned to the Queen Mary for the first Super Trainer Showdown. Though players competed and earned golden invitations, there were still some tournament slots open to the general public. Thousands flocked to Long Beach to try and enter, but were mostly turned away. Not exactly a shining moment for Pokémon's fledgling organized play, but at least those disappointed trainers were given a ticket to tour the Queen Mary and some rocket boosters for their efforts. They could also get a picture with a giant dark Raichu card, and even take home a Polaroid pic or a digital version on a floppy disk. If that doesn't scream the year 2000, I don't know what does. Those that made it into the tournament hall were greeted with a room full of hundreds of competitors spread across three age divisions. Unlike the qualifiers, you didn't need to win out to reach the next stage of play. Instead, players competed in about six to eight rounds of Swiss play, similar to today's tournaments, but that's where the similarities end. Each round lasted only 25 minutes. A player earned a decisive win worth three points for winning within 25 minutes, two points in an adjudicated win if they had fewer prize cards remaining than their opponent at the end of the round, one point for a draw where both players had the same number of prize cards when time was called, and zero points for a loss. At the end of Swiss play, the top eight players were assembled based on records and resistance and advanced to the final stage of tournament play. The top eight was played in a best of one single elimination bracket with the winner taking home this sweet Machamp medal, 
and the title of first Super Trainer Showdown Champion. The metagame in each age division consisted of Haymaker, Sponge, Rain Dance, and Do the Wave. When the smoke cleared and the top eight emerged, many players may have been shocked that no Rain Dance deck placed in the top eight outside of the 10 and under division. One thing was clear, however, players were finally realizing the strength of Rocket's sneak attack. Several of the top eight lists ran three copies, with many maxing out at four. No wonder setup decks like Rain Dance struggled. Here's a look at the bracket for the 10 and under division. It's pretty much what you'd expect, other than the Haymaker deck teching Articuno. Of interest here is Ken Knight's Clefable list. While many acknowledged the strength of Metronome, players were fearful to run Clefable given the frail Clefairy and the ease Hitmonchan had in KOing it. Backed by plenty of strong Haymaker partners, clearly Clefairy's shortcomings weren't an issue. Actually, the only loss on the day the ultimate winner of the event had was to this Clefable deck. Speaking of the division champion, let's take a look at Joseph V. Ray's winning Rain Dance list. This list went for maximum consistency, opting for the highest counts of Bill, Oak, and Computer Search, all while running Pokemon Trader to shuffle Blastoise back into the deck and avoid oaking it away. Of note is Defender, likely to tank hits on Squirtle's early game from the slew of strong basics in this format, and that Joseph opted to run the maximum 4 rocket sneak attack. He clearly wanted to fly through his deck and deprive his opponents of any options to stall out his strategy. Additionally, his tournament report noted the important advantage sneak attack gave him, seeing what his opponent's options were for the next turn and removing those he was most concerned about. Youngster Joey clearly appreciated the power of the sneak. In the end, it wouldn't matter. The finals consisted of his opponent opening a lone Magmar in a dead hand, allowing Joseph to quickly power up an Articuno and attach a plus power before announcing freeze drive for game. Best of one at its finest. Turning next to the 11 to 14 age division, it's clear that powerful basics dominated this era of the game. Sure, Wigglytuff had placings, but in each list it was backed by many of the same basic Pokémon players had come to utilize. Living up to his name, Jack Savage took down the division with his Sponge deck. In his tournament report, he discussed why he revisited this base fossil archetype over a more traditional Haymaker build, noting its strong matchup against Haymaker decks running Hitmonchan, as well as Wigglytuff's susceptibility to energy removals and reliance on hitting early Professor Oaks. Jack actually saw our first history video and reached out to us to talk more about his STS run with Sponge. In addition to the analysis provided in his Pojo report, he told us that he constructed his deck specifically to capitalize on the luck-based elements of the base to rocket format, using his 60 card slots to take advantage of even the slightest instance of bad luck by his opponents and build upon the good luck that came his way. Looking at his list with this retrospective in mind, the card choices definitely make sense, like why he only ran three sneak attacks. If you could capitalize on an opponent's low hand size or bad draws, you didn't need the maximum four copies to lock them out of the game. His list is constructed to be more reactive than previous sponge lists, opting not to run Bill at all and instead including Chansey and three nightly garbage run to continually reuse Chansey to stall for time. The tournament played out exactly as Jack saw it. He overwhelmed Haymaker decks and stalled Wigglytuff out, attacking only once the tough decks ran out of steam. Of note is the runner-up deck to Jack, Cody Barrett's Wigglytuff stall deck, running only one card from Team Rocket, that being four copies of Full Heal Energy. Opting to play a grindier match harkening back to the days of Base Fossil clearly paid off for Cody. He could whittle opponent's Pokemon down while walling with Chansey and building up a strong bench of Wigglytuff. One other fun tidbit from the 11-14 age division is that the top four game between Cody and Zach Froelich went to sudden death when Zach, who had been behind all game, gusted and knocked out one of Cody's damaged Scyther, forcing a tie in prizes and thus sudden death. They shuffled up for a new game, laying out only a single prize card. While both players had slow starts, Cody started Chansey and stuck a double colorless on it despite being last turn one. 
an unfortunate tails flip from Zack on Electabuzz's Thundershock attack, and an immediate DCE top deck from Cody sealed the match with a double edge attack. A much better game for Zack was his top 8 match, where he won the game in about 5 minutes, flying through his deck to ensure he never allowed Matt Townsend to establish a fully powered Wigglytuff. Finally, the 15 and up age division was evenly split between Wigglytuff and Haymaker style decks. In fact, the list suggests that there was still a bit of an ongoing struggle within deck building in the game over whether choosing trainers that provided options to grind out wins were more important than taking an aggressive approach of draw and disruption to try and quickly overwhelm opponents. While the other divisions suggested the latter, Andrew Marshall's Haymaker build certainly favored the grind, running Lickitung to stall, strong draw, and several one and two counts of cards to maximize his options, Andrew was certainly prepared for anything. And that included William Liu's Wigglytuff deck that was basically a more refined list from the base to fossil days. He doesn't run a single card from Team Rocket in this list, but when you're getting second place at the first STS, who can really question that decision? Other interesting decks from the top eight include Darren Giao, who ran a Haymaker variant focused around Hitmonchan and Magmar. I say it's notable because of the strong stall focus of the deck, running four Smokescreen Magmar to control the game's tempo, as well as three Chansey, four Scoop Ups, and almost max counts of the energy removal cards. Darren saw grinding as the way to take games, and these cards, along with the options provided by running two Ditto and two Double Colorless Energy, certainly prove it. The other interesting deck is Jared Stein's take on Wigglytuff, running Fossil Ghastly over Scyther to take advantage of Ghastly's energy conversion attack to retrieve valuable double colorless energies from the discard pile. This comboed well with running four scoop ups, so picking up damaged Wigglytuffs wasn't as painful, preserving Jigglypuff, and taking easy prizes off the board. This might also explain why he opted to run two nightly garbage runs in his list. Also notable is the inclusion of the new Rainbow Energy for his multicolored attackers, as well as Goop Gas Attack to deal with Rain Dance builds. Unfortunately, Jared lost to Chris Nethery's Magmar Haymaker deck following an aggressive start from Chris. At one point, Chris actually played last when Jared had no cards in his hand just to refill his own deck and avoid losing from deck out. Now that's playing to your outs. Despite the fun weekend and bestowing of medals on the first STS champions, Wizards was worried about the direction of the game. Outside of Blastoise and Wigglytuff, the game seemed to be almost entirely dominated by basic Pokémon backed by dozens of powerful trainer cards. In fact, one Poképarent noted in her tournament report that the metagame was boring and older players were growing tired of running decks that contained 30 or more trainer cards. For a franchise built on growing your Pokémon stronger by training and evolving them, this just didn't sit right with them. In fact, this was starting to be more of the growing sentiment within the community, not just among the tournament's players. Pokémon was a fun game, but when you're getting hit by a barrage of sneak attacks to the point you can't even play the game, well, where's the joy in that? Such broken cards could prove detrimental to the fledgling game, and with another Super Trainer Showdown in the East coming later in the fall, Wizards employees looked for a solution. Just the same, players looked to Wizards for answers, and at the moment, they had none. Japan created the cards, Wizards just printed and distributed them. Japan consistently refused Wizards' request to consider banning or restricting cards like Magic the Gathering did. With game design beyond their control, Wizards had no way of stopping the chaos the next two sets would bring. Hey, hey Aaron, put a chaos gem in here. I don't care how, I, 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 I just want that card. Thanks. If you enjoyed learning about the game's first tournament circuit and seeing the deck list players actually use to achieve success in them, consider liking and subscribing so we know you're enjoying this kind of content. We're looking forward to presenting more on the early years of Pokemon and have a lot of great projects in the works. This is the Ruby Retro Historian, signing off.